2008. The Legislative Council Committee is convening this morning to consider whether to continue the long-standing practice of claiming copyright on the Oregon Revised Statutes. The Chair notes that the Committee has never claimed copyright over the law itself, but on those materials added by staff in preparing each edition of the ORS. I'd like to ask Council to provide a brief explanation, please, for my fellow legislators as well as those who are in attendance here today at the meeting. Go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, in the materials uh, that you have in front of you, you have a, um, a memo from me explaining the situation, and I'll just briefly summarize that. Um, it has been um, the direction of the Legislative Council Committee since 1953 to uh, uh, copyright each edition of the ORS that uh, uh, is prepared uh, at the conclusion of the uh, each um, regular session of the Legislative Assembly. Uh, we have done that um, since 1953. Um, and uh, as you all know, the uh, Legislative Council Office uh, prepares and sells to the public the printed volumes of the ORS. Um, Pursuant to uh, your direction, um, since 1997, the um, office also enters into uh, licensing agreements with uh, commercial providers of uh, legal uh, research information. Um, those providers uh, typically charge lawyers and other um, intensive users of legal research services a subscription fee to access the information. Uh, in addition, pursuant to statute and your direction, uh, since 1997, the uh, ORS has been available uh, without charge for free in electronic form on the um, legislature's website, um, uh, in addition to the other legislative documents, bills, the session laws. Um, committee agendas and the like. Um, somewhat by chance, uh, in uh, several months ago, um, members of the uh, uh, Legislative Council staff came across a website by, um, operated by the Justia Company. It is a website that um, is a, provides uh, legal research materials, uh, also provides uh, internet marketing services to lawyers and is a site that has advertising that's uh, directed primarily at lawyers posted. The, um, we noted that the ORS was posted there um, under, actually under their copyright and um, we asked, uh, we, we sent them a letter asking them to take that down, which they, they complied with, uh, but without, uh, with objection. And uh, we then entered into a series of discussions with them about um, first exploring the idea of Justia, uh, Justia entering into a traditional licensing agreement with us as we have done with other commercial uh, providers. Uh, and then entering into a Creative Commons style license uh, that is basically a license that allows the uh, user to use the electronic database without charge and nevertheless be in compliance with copyright claims. Uh, Justy's assertion, however, is that um, the ORS is not capable of being copyrighted in any form and at the moment they are um, considering uh, seeking a declaratory judgment in federal court uh, to that effect. However, uh, they have uh, asked you to review uh, the ORS copyright policy uh, and perhaps revisit that. As I, as I noted, it's been the uh, policy since 1953. Um, I'll also give you a brief update on federal law. Federal copyright protection is initially is grounded in the uh, U.S. Constitution, and but um, case law surrounding that has evolved over time. There's a significant 1991 U.S. Supreme Court case 
that um, basically has made originality the standard by which um, materials can be subject to copyright um, and in that case basically provides that uh, for material to be capable of copyright it must um, either in its form or in its compilation uh, there must be some uh, minimal level of creativity. Uh, the case, the facts of that case uh, involved a, a telephone book and the court decided that uh, the uh, listing of phone numbers and names associated with that did not meet that minimal threshold level of creativity. Uh, subsequent case law has um, uh, more oriented towards legal research materials has also concluded that um, publications that list, for example, the procedural history of cases or the names of attorneys and the like uh, are not, are also not capable of, or parallel citations are not capable of copyright. Uh, the ORS is, in our view, somewhat uh, more than that, but it is not entirely clear the extent to which under this new law uh, it is capable of copyright. I'll note in your materials um, the third tab in gives you some examples of what in uh, the ORS we, uh, the committee claims, claims copyright over and what it does not, namely the committee claims copyright over lead lines, editorial notes, the chapter organization, index and annotations um, and you may what you're being asked to consider here is whether you uh, at this point want to disclaim that uh, copyright going forward in light of uh, the prevalence of uh, legal research becoming an online function rather than a book function and the um, prevalence of sites on the internet that provide legal research uh, to users for free and in light of your public policy choice to provide the um, ORS to the public in general and this is a long-standing choice of yours as well on the legislative uh, website. I'd be happy to take any if you have any questions to answer them. Any questions? I have a few, Mr. Chair. Well, then please ask them. Um, first, what other states have similar copyright restrictions that uh, we are seeking to implement or, or continue mm -hmm. in this case? Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Richardson, uh, there are 26 states um, that claim some form of copyright. Whether they enforce that or not is a different question, but there are 26 states that do in 24 uh, that make no statements um, that we have been able to determine uh, with respect to their uh, statutes. May I continue? Sure. Is there a policy that is good for Oregon in maintaining the restrictions that um, that are being sought to over that, that are being sought by Justia to to change? Mm -hmm. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Richardson, there um, perhaps would be some concern about the continued accuracy of um, not the laws but the additional material that, that uh, staff adds to the laws. However, uh, I should note that regardless of the decision the committee makes, the Oregon Revised Statutes as prepared by the Legislative Council Office will be the official version of the ORS and it is that version that um, by uh, court rules are the only version you can cite to in court proceedings. So you, re you continue really to con uh, maintain control over the accuracy of um, whatever is out there for official purposes. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, Hunt, please. Uh, following up on Representative Richardson's sure. question, the so in, in terms of that issue of really protecting the, the core integrity of, of ORS, are, are there other ways to do that 
we, we've attempted, we and apparently 25 other states have attempted to do that by claiming some form of copyright. Are there other ways in your estimation to do that that do not involve claiming copyright? Uh, well, Mr. Chair and uh, Representative Hunt, we, in, in theory, we could provide only the printed version of the ORS, though, though technology is, is, continues to evolve in this area and um, it will not, in fact, the technology exists now to take the printed, even if there were no elect publicly available electronic version, to take the printed version, convert that into electronic text, and then have that available. So, so um, in terms of technology, the answer is no, but in terms of the practical effect of that, it's, it isn't in anyone's interest to have inaccurate versions of the ORS out there. And because only the official version will be recognized for official legal actions, such as court matters and the like, uh, that will be strong protection. Representative Rosenbaum, you look like you want to say or say or ask a question. Um, thank you, Mr. President. I guess I was just following up on Representative Hunt's question because I see, Dexter, in your memo that there have been discussions about non-monetary licensing agreements yes. that could be negotiated, which seem to be designed to protect the integrity of the statutes from alteration in some form. I mean, everybody hears about Wikipedia and how you can change the number of Asian elephants and whether they're an endangered species by just getting a whole bunch of people to write in and say they're not. Um, Obviously, I'm making light of this, but it's a serious matter um, that we don't want the statutes out there and being changed in some form that would be harmful to the public or to the public interest. So could you comment on that a little? Sure. Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Rosenbaum, yes. Um, first, uh, there is a Creative Commons license approach that is available. And in fact, we, we've had discussions with uh, Justia and the other interested parties here about that option. Uh, they actually directed us in that direction at first, but um, they are at this time not interested in pursuing that arrangement. I'll also note in your materials you have an article from the uh, Oregon State Bar Journal uh, this month's edition uh, describing uh, the trend of uh, legal research being available through a Creative Commons style license, and actually the article discusses uh, publicresource.org, which is uh, another entity, uh, Carl Malamud, the founder of that organization, is here today uh, to discuss uh, this situation as well, and uh, you may want to follow up on that question with him. Anyone else, any questions? No, sir. Got a verdict? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Um, could you um, elaborate on how the Creative Commons concept works and why that may not be acceptable mm -hmm. as an alternative? Um, Mr. Chair, Senator Burdick, uh, the Creative Commons uh, license basically, uh, my understanding is that, is that it is a license you can, uh, as a holder of copyright, can enter into to authorize anyone um, in the public to use the copyrighted material, uh, but, uh, and to pass that on to others as well, subject to each, each person who receives the um, material agreeing to the terms of the license. You can structure that in such a way so that simply by posting the terms of the license on the legislative website, for example, that would be all that would be needed um, to achieve that. Um, and so that, so that if someone were to download, for example, ORS from the legislative website, they would, by that action, be agreeing to the terms of the license. Okay, so follow up, Mr. Chair. Um, so if that were to take place, then would would the holder, would the person who agreed to the terms of those licenses, you know, J Justia, for example, would that be a legitimate source for um, court purposes? Uh, that would require an additional change on the part of um, of the legislature uh, through the, through court rules. Uh, court rules, which actually is not a uh, 
it would be a, require a change in court rules. Uh, court rules in this state recognize an official version of the ORS, and that is the uh, version produced by the Office of Legislative Counsel. Senator Nelson, please. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, it seems to me that you know we're living in an age where you have open source technology, pretty much freedom of what's going on. There's no propriety, proprietary effects of of even software is now diminishing. Um, we may technically be right, as I read the information that you've given to us, but is it worth the risk and reward? I mean, where is that? Is that really what we're talking about? What's the risk and what's the reward? And do we want to make this stuff open and to the public, which it already really is? And how much money does the state actually gain by selling these books and you know stuff like that? <laughs> Seems to me that that's a legitimate question. Um, Mr. Chair, Senator Nelson, I can provide you information regarding the funding, the specific funding, if you if you want. I mean, so, I mean to me, it's just a question of is this fight really worth fighting? <laughs> circumstance I mean it's out of it's in the public now you you do a lot of it electronically right now don't you don't we don't we do that mr. chair senator Nelson yeah it's posted on the uh, the legislative website right now and it has been for a number of years uh, I'll, I'll note that the um, sales of the printed volume of ORS um, support uh, uh, they're provided at cost uh, by statute at cost to uh, the consumers of uh, legal information the cost involved is the cost not just of printing and distributing the physical the bound ORS but also the more significant costs of editing and compiling the enactments that um, the legislature enacts into a cod codified edition and roughly um, we generate uh, two million dollars in, in ORS sales, and that equals in round numbers our costs, of which five hundred thousand dollars is the actual printing and distribution costs, and the remaining one and a half million, so about seventy-five percent, is the cost of editing and compiling the legislative enactments. Well, could you still sell that, even though I mean we didn't do the copyright? You could still sell the books. And there wouldn't be any. Doing that. Uh, there, has anybody thought about, you know, is, is this going to cut into your marketplace if these folks get, get their get their copyright declared declaratory judgment sustained? Um, that's correct, Senator. It would not. If you disclaim copyright, it would then also permit any printer who wanted to decide to market their own version of the ORS, uh, it would allow them to do that as well. And so the, the $2 million that are currently generated, we're, uh, there's uncertainty as to what will happen in the future. Thank you. Any further questions before we go to testimonies? Okay, just one second. Okay. We're going to, uh, we have two panels of invited testimony before we go to general public testimony. One of the panels is not here, so they have submitted a letter. So that panel will speak by letter. <laughs> 